Hello and welcome to Apologies Hot Pants, the nostalgic spin-off series from the Five Year Plan podcast. Questionable name, great content. Let's just move on to that. And I'm joined today by two people to look back at a pivotal time in Crystal Palace's history, the 98-99 season, when a lot went down. Uh, and we're using the Athletics' excellent coverage uh, with their rebooted series, looking back at 99. And of course, that means that the one and only Dom Fifield is here to talk me through it. Dom, how are you doing? I'm good, Jim. Are you okay? I'm okay, mate. I'm very good indeed. And joining us then to talk about 98-99 is a man who was quite literally there at the time and led the team to survival almost single-handedly. It's the one and only Dean Austin. Dino, how you doing? How you doing, mate? You okay? Not too bad at all. How are you doing? Well, yeah, good, mate. Good. Healthy mind, healthy body and all that, you know? Love it. You were just talking to us off air, actually, and I was thinking, do you want to be my life coach, Dino, actually? It's really <laughs> inspiring about a healthy mind, healthy body. It was great. <laughs> Got to do it, mate. Um, right, before we crack on, I need to remind you that The Athletic are a world-class team of writers covering every club, including the best coverage of Crystal Palace. They're a subscription-based website and app, completely ad-free, no annoying pop-ups, just brilliant articles. Welcome to the new home of football writing. And if you visit theathletic.co.uk forward slash FYP, you can start a seven-day free trial and receive 50% off your yearly subscription. Now, as part of this rebooted series, Dom has written three articles around, let's face it, a time when he could have written about 20 articles. So much happened at Palace at that time. There's an article on Sasser Churchage's NATO bombing protests. There's an article on the fans night at the Fairfield Halls when it all went down. And of course, there's an excellent article with Dino and Andy Martin talking about that Norwich game in April 99, which of course we'll come on to soon. Before we do that, Dino, I'm keen to get your opinion on Project Restart and where we are with football returning, obviously as a former player, as a current coach. What are your thoughts on whether football should come back, when it will come back, sort of where we stand? Um, It's about being sensible. For me, if someone someone asked me this question in a way, Dean, if I was a professional, if it was me now, would I be prepared to go back and play? And my answer is, is that with all the measures that they are showing that they're putting in place and the, the amount of testing that they are putting in place. I mean, you're talking about all these professional footballers getting tested almost every day, daily, before games, after games, daily. They're going to get treated better than what the general public are because mm-hmm. we can't get tests for love nor money. Yeah. So I think if, if, the, if things are being put in place and shown... You know, we are. What will happen though? Someone will get it, and then there'll be a huge panic. Oh, we should cancel the season this out, and that's ridiculous because someone could get the flu tomorrow. Don't we have to and accept that people are going to get it? I mean, footballers course, will get it. Yeah, of course. But what if someone was asking me, and I got asked this, and and to be fair, my wife just look, was looking at me when I was answering this question, and, and just said, "Well, because this is the way it always is for me. Professional football is my life." Professional football is my job. Mm. Professional football pays my bills and supports my family. Mm. That's what it does. If I, for example, was asked as a professional footballer, would I be prepared to play? Answer, yes. You've shown me that it is. Then you're going to have to go into quarantine for six weeks, into a hotel, because that's what, then that's my job. That's what I do. Mm. And I, I do to- that at my club. I have to admit, if there's one person, one footballer that, that the virus couldn't take down, it's definitely Dean Austin. That'd be my first, <laughs> my first answer to that. Um, yeah. You joined on a, on a Bosman. I think it was on a, on a Bosman from Spurs yeah, 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 yeah. in the summer. Yeah. I'm sure no one at that time, well, I guess player-wise, I'm sure no one was aware what was going to happen. But I'm wondering, when you're having those negotiations with Palace at that time, having come from Spurs, was there anything that made you think did you get any sort of whiff of, you know, financial irregularity or anything that made you think, oh, this, this, this ain't right? No, I mean, I, um, I joined Palace for two reasons. The first reason was Terry Venables because he had already signed me before at Tottenham. And the second reason was that I come to win. And the, and the dream that was, or the project that was sold to me um, was that, uh, I think we've got a real, real chance here of 
of being winners. I, I, listen, I've won promotions both as as a player, three or four promotions as a player, three or four promotions as a coach. And I've always I, I'm used to winning. I'm not used to losing. I'm not. I'm. 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 I'm used to being in situations of, of adversity where my resilience has to come out and shine through. But I joined the, because of the project. The project excited me, um, and I honestly was genuinely really, really excited about it. But you, you joined a, a squad that became increasingly bloated, didn't you? I mean, by the time probably about September, October time that year, we must have had 30, 30 32 first team players. And across the back, we had about 13 centre halves, uh, quite a few fullbacks. So I think Mark Edwards, he was still there when you joined as, yeah, as well. Yeah, he was still there, yeah. I mean, did, did, did anyone, did you just look at that and think, wow, we've got so many options here? Well, we, we should, once we click, we'll storm this league. Or, or did part of you think, well, hold on a second, we're a championship club? No, I, I don't think. I think that when you're a player, at the time I was 28, I think that as a player, you don't look at things like that. You look at, um, sort of, you look at it and you, and, you, and you look and you see that there's players like Attilio Lombardo, Matt Jansen, you know, you see players like that mm. that are already in the building, Mark Edworthy, Andy Linegan, you know, you see these players already there and then you think, Oh, okay, you get sold a, a bit of a story in regards to that there's going to be other players as well as yourself that are decent calibre players. So obviously, Craig Moore, Gordon Petrich, yeah. you know, Max Fenson, you know, and, and you go on and, and you kind of think, right, well, okay, well, you know, this is, um, to be fair, I, I've never really looked, I've never really looked, I, I would not, I've never not, looked at a squad and gone for Mark Edworthy's there or Jamie Smith's there I might have my ears for it no problem bring it on I'm the best man win Mm. and it will be me (laughs) no but that was my positivity no with all seriousness that that was that was how positive that I was as a player Mm -hmm. that's how confident I was in my ability obviously I had had the um I left Spurs. I needed to leave Spurs, but I had some, I had some horrific injuries. Well, yeah. a horrific injury. Two, well, two horrific injuries. One on both knees. Um, and although I didn't realise that I was past my best then, I didn't realise that Palace were never going to see the best of me. To be fair, Spurs had my best years. To be fair, 22, 22 to twenty four were my best years of my of my career. But then I I had bad injuries. Um, But I didn't join Palace and think, even then I thought, yeah, well, I've just got to change my life a little bit. I've got to manage my body a bit better. I had to lose Spurs. Medically, I was, there was a few of us at the time that were seriously, seriously let down by the club and and the surgeons. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I had to leave. But I didn't join Palace and think, right, all I thought was that I'm 20, I'm coming into a prime of my life. Yeah, okay, I've got to manage my life a little bit differently now. I've got to be a little bit more disciplined in regards to what I do in the mornings. Regards, I used to be in, I was one of the first in every day. I lived the furthest away and I was going to move mm-hmm. to be close to, 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 to the ground and the training ground. And while my, my um, buying of an apartment was going through, Mark's then situation flipped in the January and I was like, well, hold on a minute, I better pull the reins off here because mm-hmm. of, no one knew what was going to happen, but I, um, I, I just, I never looked at a squad and thought, "Oh, I worry about him. I worry about him. I worry about myself." And you have to I remember always, that. I, I wish I had that. Was, I, I, wish I, had that of, I wish I had that some positivity in my life. I, <laughs> I need some of that. No, my view just always was that, you know, if if I if I physically prepare myself well enough, um, I know that. I will be good enough to get by. I felt that at 28, I probably knew the game better than what I did when I was 22. So what I might not have had at 22, I'd gained something when I was 28 through my experience. And I also knew that my resilience and my determination, my application would be far better than anyone else's. I just, that was how I felt. Um, 
But there again, I think exactly the same way as a coach now. Yeah. But you, and again, you know, when you're a coach, it's different because you can't can control the 11 players that are on the pitch. You can only influence them. You can influence them in a week, but on a match day, you're not going to, you know, yeah, tactically you might change something, but you're reliant on other people. But I still have the same resilience, I still have the same confidence, still have the same attitude. I still prepare. I pr- prepare. I believe I pr- prepare the best that a coach can, pr- can prepare mm. in regards to my diligence. Um, and what I'm doing and, and my preparation and my planning. And just like so, those, those early days when you joined, I'm guessing, I mean, you played with some top, top players at Tottenham, you know, at, at, at the highest level. But I'm guessing some of the players in training at Palace, like Lombardo and Janssen that you talked about, I mean, they must have been incredible to watch. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I was, you know, I always look back, I look back with fondness of all my spells, of all my clubs, and I played with some really good players. Um, and I feel privileged. I feel privileged and humbled by uh, the great players that I've play, played with, the great people that I've met along the way. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything. I don't have regrets because, you know, people go, oh, well, that must have been like they talk about Palace and they talk about the first six months. They said, oh, it must have been a really tough time. And they said, well, it was a learning experience. Yeah. Just made me even more resilient and even more dare determined. It's, you, you have a choice. You have a choice in life. You can either lie down and accept it, or you can roll your sleeves up and get on with it and, and tackle it and meet it head on. Did that Bristol City game where you came off at half time, and I think you, when you spoke in the article, you mentioned that Terry almost felt he had to. To, to get, take you out of the firing line because it was affecting the other guys in the squad and things were it was it was weird at that point wasn't it we were winning a lot of home games but dreadful away from home we just couldn't get that balance right at all did did that did that affect you at all then or did did that just make you think right well I'm gonna I'm gonna prove them wrong uh, I think that of I remember we played Portsmouth at home um, it was a real muddy I think we won four one yeah and the team played really well and. Um, I made a mistake, but I think we were, I think it was either one one or two one in the game, and I made a, I made a mistake. I think the ball came at me and it rolled under my foot, or I had a bad touch, and then I gave a bad pass, and I I, I heard like a, like a a chorus of boos, and I was kind of like, they booing me, <laughs> and I was like, give me the ball, I want the ball, give me the ball. That that was always my way, and that was something that I learned when I was at Spurs. Vinny Samways was one of the best footballers I ever played with. Mm-hmm. Technically unbelievable, and I watched him have to deal with this at Spurs. We were playing one day against Sheffield Wednesday, and he used to go after the ball the way Spurs played because we played literally under Rosie Ardiles. We played total football, mm-hmm. and he went after the ball to get the ball in his own box, got it off the centre half, gave it away, and they scored Sheffield Wednesday. We lost three one. The next time we kicked off, the ball come back to him. He controlled it at 36,000. They booed him. Yeah. And I, I just saw this guy's I saw this guy's attitude and his mentality. He just kept going, give me the ball, give me the ball. Every time it like he was hot, like, we could have had a ball for him and a ball for the rest of the team. <laughs> but every time he got it, the whole the whole crowd, 36,000 were on him. And it did not affect him one bit. And I had a conversation with him after it about it he sat in the other and he said they, he said listen if you, are you confident in your own bit yeah I'm confident in your own. then get on the ball <laughs> we're all going to make mistakes mate get on the ball and play we're t- and this was his view this is Tottenham Hotspur this is the way that we play get on the football pass the football and that was, for me was kind of my attitude but Chris, it didn't matter to me at like of course you know it's not nice and you of course you are aware um, I always think, you know, I understand, and I don't think there's, that there's so much of it now. I think that obviously crowds boo teams, you know, mm-hmm. if the team's having a, specific, a, a, a specifically bad time or the manager or whatever, they will normally, they will boo the team at half time or whatever when they go off if they're losing to them. I don't think there's so much now on the individual players. Mm-hmm. I think it, there's more on the individual players now because that, the opposing crowd are jealous of the player because he's a great player. Yeah. Like, yeah. For example, Wilf's a great example. Yeah. Like Wilf is a great example. Everyone wants to go after Wilf 
because Wilf's a great player. Yeah, you, you get know? on their team. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that um, sort of in, in, in them days when I, there was a little bit more of that, I think that, you know, crowds don't, like, crowds don't understand that it's not going to help the player. It's certainly not, not, it's certainly not going to help the team. Mm. Yeah. Um, you can't support the team. I actually remember, this, this is a, quite a funny story, in this moment, of, in this period. And um, I actually stopped my parents coming to the game. Well, I stopped my mum coming to the games. Wow. Um, so my my mum and dad were uh, been my biggest supporters over my career. My mum, God bless her, she passed away 10 years ago. But my mum and my dad were, were massive influences in my career. And um, my mum was coming to the games and this, that and the other. And I said to her after, oh, probably about, probably in the first 10 games or so, I said to her, I said, Mum, like she was getting upset about it and what have you, and she said, I don't know how you, you're the strongest person I know, I don't know how, how you, I said, look, Mum, this is my job, this is what I do, and this is not going to change. The only way I'm going to change it is by performing better, mm-hmm. and it will, because I always believe that form is temporary, you know, if you're good, you're not just going to become bad overnight, it's, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's a form, we all go through it. Um, so I actually stopped my mum from coming, I said, said to my dad, I said, look, dad, no problem. I said, I, I know that you can handle it better than mum. If you want to come, then still come. He says, well, I, I'm coming because I want to support you. I went, well, that's up to you. But you don't have to come. I don't need you. I know I've got your support. So I actually stopped my mum from coming. Wow. When I got back into the team, so after that spell that happened and then I, I weren't in the team for a period of time, when I actually got back in in March, um, I don't think it was... It wasn't the Bradford game. I can tell you when it was. We was playing Sunderland. We played mm-hmm. Sunderland. I think it was a bank holiday Monday. Easter Monday, yeah. 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 And uh, my mum said to me, uh, obviously, being a bit of a glory hunter, I think I'd already scored a weight at Norwich at that yeah. point. <laughs> and she said that um, I, I want to come to the game. So I said, no problem. Like, you want to come? But mum, you're going to have to listen to people. That, that, don't get me wrong. That there's a... There's a very much a hardcore batch of supporters at Palace that are showing me a little bit of appreciation, a little bit of love. I said, which is great. I said, but there's still a lot of cynicism against me. I said, and you've got to be prepared to listen to it, Mum. I said, and you, it's just the way it is. It's football. She said, okay. Just come to the game. And she was, <laughs> she was sitting in the crowd, like with the uh, the rest of the. Um, the players' families and this, that and the other. But where it was at Palace, you still had uh, fans that would have season season tickets in certain parts. And there was um, a young girl, I say a young girl, young lady, probably about 23, 24, sitting there with her boyfriend or her dad. And um, I'd done something, I I don't know what it was, but I'd done something good in the game. and, And the woman went, Oh well, oh, well played, Austin. Not that you'll get any praise from me because you've been shit for the previous six months. Oh, God. And my mum went, "Oi, who do you think you're talking about? <laughs> that is my son. You need to shut your mouth." Wow. And the girl just went, "Oh, uh, sorry." Kind of went down the hill and I like, just uh, uh, my mum. My mum actually become really good friends with this girl because my mum used to sit in the same seat and she sat in front. Okay. And my mum actually, like, they used to swap coffees and flasks and sweets and all that in the game. Okay. And I was like, oh dear, but very, very fun. That's brilliant.